just happened. Hi, friends. Uh, I decided I'm going to document my journey of reading House of Leaves. I started reading it this morning, and I am not a tabbing person, but I am tabbing the hell out of this book, and so uh, I thought I would take you along with me on this journey. I'm not even that far into this thing yet. Oh, boy. warning, this is going to be a super spoilery video, so if you haven't read House of Leaves or you don't want to be spoiled for House of Leaves, maybe read it first and come back if you are feeling so inclined. I am reading it this month. It is super trippy, but in an interesting way. And again, like I'm not even that far into it yet, but I want to talk about it because there's just like so much to unpack and research and think about. And I see why people have gotten kind of obsessed with it. I also see why this would not be everybody's cup of tea because it seems clear that to really get the most out of it, you need to do a lot of work and pay close attention. And it probably is going to help if you're familiar with the Bible, the Old Testament, and biblical imagery because there's so much of it in here. Uh, yeah, I'm finding this fascinating. Creepy, but fascinating. And the way that he's chosen to do this is, is, is really interesting. So I think what I'm going to do is just kind of flip through some of the places I've taken notes. Oh, and I guess I should talk about the way that I'm reading this book because I know there are different ways to do it. There are people who just read the main text all the way through and then go back and read the footnotes. There's people who read both at once, people who flip back and flip around. Like spoilers don't super bother me in a reading experience like this. So I am primarily reading it front to back including the footnotes all at once. However, there are places where the footnotes will reference other chapters in the book, and in some of those cases I might go and read that chapter, even if it's kind of out of context. I've done that once so far. That is the way that I am approaching this. I feel like everybody's going to be a little bit different in how they read. I am the kind of person who likes the puzzle pieces and I like putting it together, which I think makes this the kind of book I would enjoy the process of reading. So yeah, let's uh, dive in. So House of Leaves only just now exists on Kindle. You can't get it on audio. Um, I know it's a notorious horror novel because it's got like blank pages and things that you have to read in the mirror. And like, I was just curious about it because people talk about it a lot. It is also kind of a nested story. Okay, so this is not for you. <laughs> it's like an ominous beginning. But you basically have this introduction written by this guy named Johnny Truant. And long story short, he discovered this manuscript in kind of a creepy way and then assembled it for publication. So what you end up with is this manuscript from this old guy who had died named Zampano. So the manuscript is purportedly about a documentary, though it's unclear whether the documentary actually exists. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But the documentary was sort of footage put together by a guy who was a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer documenting moving into a house with his wife and two children, except that the house ends up being weird and and creepy and has stuff going on in it. Okay, so then the manuscript has footnotes and the footnotes that look like this are the original footnotes from the author. But the footnotes, including sometimes very lengthy footnotes that have this font, are from Johnny Truant, the guy who found the manuscript and put it together. Okay, so like that's the basic, that's the basic setup here. There is just so much. I'm just gonna go through like the things that I noted. This is the first thing that I think did a good job of making it creepy, is he found this note written by the old man saying, basically like if you try to get it published, and it doesn't work, you should rejoice because the truth stands the test of time. So the creepy part, obviously, in a meta sense is you are reading this published novel and it stood the test of time. So there's probably truth in it. So that's kind of the like the meta thing there. We have this phrase. I've been Googling things. Um, technically, it's it must be, but it's better translated as must it be? Excuse my uh, my great handwriting. Uh, this is something that Beethoven wrote in the score notes of his 16th string quartet, and it is meant to express a sense of inevitability. Must it be? 
this I find, find interesting. So the Navidson record, right? But I wrote some of this in later. I'll show you the bottom part now. But, but Navidson is the name of the guy who supposedly created the documentary. And this obviously sounds very similar to David's son and David's son was Solomon. And I'm guessing that this is intentional because, again, there is a ton, like I went back and thought about this later because there's so much religious biblical imagery in this book. I What I say here is see cover page. So what's interesting is under here, there's this cover page. And if you read these notes, I think these are intended to be some of the notes from the manuscript, right? And it says something about hew the boy in half, right? And again, right, like if Navidson is intended to be like Solomon, there's a story in the Bible where Solomon, who's supposed to be super wise, has these two women arguing about who an infant belongs to. And his recommendation is like, well, just cut the baby in half and give half to each woman. And the real mom is discovered because she's the one who refuses and says, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Give it to her. So it's interesting that like, his name seems to be related to Solomon. The cover page has this thing about that, who the child really belongs to, except we're putting a super creepy demonic spin on it. This is another thing that is important. Will Navidson is this prize-winning photojournalist who won the Pulitzer for his picture of a dying girl in the Sudan. So this becomes important in another place. Let me see if I can find where it is. So if you flip ahead a little bit, there's this whole thing about him saying the name Delil and his wife freaking out. So I'm like, okay, who is Delil? So I go down and look at the footnotes and it says, well, chapter 19 deals exclusively with the subject. So I'm like, okay, let's go check out chapter 19. In chapter 19, as it turns out, Delil is the name of the girl he took this photograph of in the Sudan. And there's this whole explanation of how he took this photograph of a dying child in the Sudan with a vulture behind her and kind of getting ready to attack her. And that's the name... Delil. Okay. There's also an interesting note here saying Navidson never photographed scenery, but he also never photographed the threat of death without interposing someone else between himself and it, which that that's, says something about his character, I guess. Like if that's, that's who we're talking about. So keep in mind all of that. So I did a little digging and um, a few things worth noting. When I first heard the name Delil, I was like, that sounds very similar to Belial or Belial. I'm not sure how you're supposed to pronounce it, but this is a demon mentioned in the Old Testament that required child sacrifice. So like, okay, first of all, we have that. Then after a little bit of research, it turns out in 1994, in real life, Kevin Carter did win a Pulitzer Prize for this photograph that is incredibly disturbing. You can look it up if you want to see what it looks like. But he took a photograph of a starving girl in the Sudan. With the, it's basically the, the photo described in the book. And there's a lot of discussion of how right after he took the photo, he left, he didn't do anything and that haunted him and he ended up committing suicide. So it's interesting because clearly he's drawing on things that have happened in real life. And in some ways, I think that lends a sense of authenticity to the story. And I think it's probably part of what makes it scary for people. Um, but it's just it's like fascinating. However, when I was looking it up, I found that Delil is also <laughs> <laughs> the name of this old German sun lotion, sun, sun lotion, sun cream for tanning, uh, which I think is, is interesting if you think about it in terms of the predatory opportunistic nature of a, a person who's going to go photograph a dying child and then do nothing and leave. And like, is that ethical journalism? And there's a lot of conversation about it. So there's there's a lot happening here. It's really interesting. So reading some of the stuff from Johnny Truant, it becomes incredibly clear that he is not trustworthy for a variety of reasons. Number one, he tells stories where he himself spins these elaborate lies that people believe, even people who know that they're false. So we know that he is a liar. And he even notes that he changed a word in the original manuscript, right? He wrote in that she said the water heater was on the fritz, but he says... Actually, that wasn't what she said. Zampano just wrote heater. So he just said that the 
heater was on the fritz. So clearly he's an unreliable narrator. We can't necessarily trust what he's saying. Again, it's just like intentionally weaving this web of deception of like what's true, what's not, and you can't really know, which is which is interesting. Okay, so one more thing. Like I said, I still have like all this stuff to read, but the last thing that really stood out to me was some of these place names. And again, I think what you're going to see here is there is a ton of reference to the, I guess, really the Torah, because I, I don't know that it's like the Christian Bible, but um, the Torah and you even have like Hebrew. There's I mean, there's 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 so much of it. Uh, but yeah, it says the house is on the corner of Succoth and Ash Tree Lane. So Succoth is the first part of the name of Succoth Beneth, which was a Babylonian deity also mentioned in the Bible. Interestingly, did not know this till I researched it, but that deity is represented as a hen with her chicks, which is creepy in light of the fact that this is a story with children who are in peril. And ash trees were used to make idols in the Bible. So clearly this is intended to be kind of creating a creepy location that is probably intended to be demonic and might cause harm to children. Um, so like the, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of foreshadowing here. We're getting a lot of biblical references and uh, yeah, I'm curious to see what happens next. Hey guys, so I'm finally back to reading House of Leaves. It is taking it's taking me so long to get through it. Uh, I think I'm like almost to 100 pages. And y'all, I think the problem is that I'm so much a puzzle box reader where I like going down rabbit holes. I like, especially with a book like this where everything means something, I like exploring all of those things. And because of it, it's taking me forever to get through the book. So at some point, I'm probably going to have to stop annotating and tabbing and googling stuff as much as I have been. Uh, but it's been fun. Like I'm having a fun experience with it. There are definitely some creepy parts of it. But I think for the most part, it's just been really interesting for me. It's been fun to try to kind of like unpack like what are all of the little Easter eggs and clues? And I know I'm missing stuff. Like there's so many layers. I mean, I've seen little bits and pieces of some of these message boards where people try to like figure out all the stuff you put in the books. It is a trip. Okay, I'm gonna say this, listen. And this is not necessarily a negative thing, but this book is very pretentious. Like it, it just is, it's hella pretentious. <laughs> and you know, it doesn't make it accessible for the average reader. It uses a lot of academic stuff. It uses a lot of like history and Greek things and languages and math. Like, you know, like it, it is a it is a pretentious book. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Like I am enjoying said pretentious book. But if that is a critique people have of it, valid. 100% valid. <laughs> like, it is not really made to be accessible. Although I think probably if you're not like me, you could just read this through it and read it for the story and not worry about the extra stuff. I just have a hard time doing that. I'm the kind of person where like, if I'm playing a video game, I want to go find all of the treasure and like search for all the hidden things. And like, do I care if it's not going to progress the story? Do I care if like, I'm just getting a plant or some rupees or some gold pieces and it's not really that big of a deal. No, I don't care because I want to find it. And uh, the, so so like House of Leaves is definitely feeding into that part of my psyche. So um, I don't think I'm going to go through all of my <laughs> my tabs and annotations and questions. I'm like annotating almost every page. Um, it's, it, it's kind of a lot, but I will do a flip through of some of it. And I have started underlining in the book and writing in it. I mean, like, I'm, I'm going to keep this. I'm enjoying it enough. Like, I'm not going to sell this to anybody else. So it'll be fun to have, like, notes of my experience. So I will do a little bit of a flip through themes I'm seeing. Oh, the other thing that's taking me really long is sometimes it'll say something and I'm like, oh, wait, that connects to a thing from earlier. And then I want to like flip back to earlier and find the thing that it connects to because there's so many like connections and things that people say and do early in the book that have like make more sense or make a different kind of sense later. Anyway, it's and I'm not even that far into it yet. Like it, it's it is a trip, guys. It is a trip. A lot of the themes in this are of, it's, it, it spends a lot of time talking about echoes. So echoes are about space 
and divinity and things existing in silences. So there's a lot of a lot of that that's happening, which is pretty interesting. Okay, well, let, let's do the flip there. You know, even though I'm not going through everything, hopefully this kind of gives you a taste of how I'm reading the book. Or for those of you who are like, hell no, this is not for me. I'm never going to read the book. I just want a taste of like what it's like. Hopefully this will kind of give you that. So I don't know where I left off. I've been like I said, I'm writing in the book. I've got so many notes. Okay, so I think this is where I left off last time was chapter three. We've got more things telling us that Johnny is an unreliable narrator. Um, this was interesting. It talks and this comes up more than once where it references the house as being like Mead Hall. And I was like, what is that? Mead Hall is from Beowulf. Mead Hall is the first place where he defeats an antagonist. It is a symbol of society, might, and power. So that's kind of interesting. Oh yeah, this was like super creepy. Um, like I think it does a good job of having these things where like if you get in your head about the book, it's gonna make you freak yourself out, which is great, I guess, for a horror novel. And then there's mention of a camera lucida, which I was like, what is that? That's interesting. It's a device used for artists or photographers that creates a double image of something so that, um, had I been thinking of a woman? I don't know. I do hope it doesn't matter. I have a terrifying feeling it does. And like having read on, oh yes, it does matter. And I don't fully know why, but I'm pretty sure, but I'm pretty sure it's Thumper. So this is, this is the thing. Like I've had people tell me they thought I wouldn't like Johnny's perspective. And I can see why, because he's like kind of a misogynist. He thinks he's in love with this um, stripper named who he calls Thumper because <laughs> she has a tattoo on the front of her hip of a bunny and uh, he's barely spoken to her. It's, it's, it's dumb. This is a thing that I've noticed a few times. I think this is just a good example of it where there will be words misspelled on purpose, which is interesting. So here it says brown blot on the morning paper. But then if you go to the footnote, footnote, footnote 36, it quotes that same line and spells morning like M-O-U-R-N instead of M-O-R-N. So like being in mourning for a death. So there are several instances of things like this where they will do a misspelling in the footnotes from Johnny. And uh, it's it's kind of interesting to, to pick up on that. This is a question I have because we find out that there was a shotgun with the initials RLB on it. And I'm wondering, because from a later page, is this Billy Raston? I mean, it's reversed letters, but who knows? Maybe we find out later in the book. I'm just like writing down questions I have. This is something interesting. So I'm reading this at the same time as my friend Liana. And Liana has a background in studying anthropology. And she was talking a little bit about how there's this excessive unpacking of actions they take that's done in the same way that um, an anthropological paper would do. And I think this is a good example of it. Talking about Karen acts like the quintessential gatherer, keeping close to the homestead. And while she may not forage for berries and mushrooms, she does accumulate tiny bits of sense. Davidson and Tom, on the other hand, are classic hunters. They select weapons, tools, reason, and they track their prey, a solution. Um, and this is all about like the, the house being measured at a larger size inside than outside and it's like freaking them out. Karen's response is to build a bookshelf to fight the uncanny and they're like well we're just gonna measure it we just need better tools but obviously like it's it's a weird house so that's not it. This is another interesting thing in here about Johnny where they talk about his childhood when he's orphaned and how he would obsessively touch and look at these newspaper clippings about the death of his father. And so eventually they took away these newspapers because he had ink on his hands all the time and they thought something was wrong. They ink about his father's death. And what's interesting is that now he's a tattoo artist, which involves ink, and he's putting this book together, which involves ink. Does he have an obsession? And I, you know, I haven't written this down. Maybe I'll like add the page number on here later, but I recently got to a page where he spills ink all over himself and all over everything. So like clearly there's like a, a there's some kind of a, uh, connection there to the death of his father, which is interesting. There's this, I don't know where it is, but there's this whole thing translated from German talking about how the meaning of uncanny in German means like not at home, basically, or uninhabited. And so it's interesting. This is another thing that we see, see is that here the children just accept this creepy place in the house that shouldn't exist. They inhabited it 
inhabiting is the opposite of uncanny. And so it's interesting that like the children um, don't treat it the same way as the adults do. Here's another example of something being misspelled, but I think on on purpose, tears her to Pisces instead of pieces. And this is the second time they've written in an astrological sign. I don't think I noted where the other one was, but I just thought that was interesting. I don't know enough about astrology to know anything about it. Okay, this is weird. It has a thing about um, a quotation from Don Quixote. And then much later, a yet untried disciple of arms had the rare pleasure of meeting the extraordinary Pierre Menard in a Paris cafe following the Second World War. But here's the thing, Pierre Menard lived in the 1700s. He didn't live after the Second World War. He was a fur trader and a US political figure. So like when you start Googling these names and looking them up, it's like particularly bizarre. And then there's something down here about talking with the framer. And I'm like, who is the framer? What does this mean? This is very confusing. So there's a lot of like little weird stuff that I think is done on purpose. So again, we've got passages talking about echoes, about how only empty places can create echoes. And the member I talked about how the definition of uncanny is being empty or like not at home. So echoes occur in uncanny places. Like this is a repeated theme that we will have ad nauseum. There's a lot of little stuff I'm Googling, which is interesting. This mentions a ancient Samuel O'Reilly at 1891, and I was curious what that meant, so I looked it up. Samuel O'Reilly was a New York tattoo artist, and he patented the first electric tattoo machine in 1891. Fun facts. I'm learning all kinds of random information from this. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of questions for myself, like, are we talking about sleep and REM? Is this foreshadowing? I'm not going to go into like too much detail on all of this. So in Johnny's perspective, we have repeated instances of violent fantasies, which is pretty disturbing. He has these very violent ideas or fantasies of things. And then we've got again, this whole thing of this, um, this the stripper named Thumper coming up, and he sleeps with this girl he meets at a bar named Lucy, and her image in his head replaces thumpers. But then there's also places where he's like, I can't write the word, or it's like empty spaces. And I'm like, what does this mean? Here is an interesting thing. The family, <laughs> this is so, this is so complicated and meta guys, but the family living in the house that the documentary was about has two children. The daughter's name is Daisy. And Thumper is always wearing Daisy sunglasses. Is Thumper Daisy? Is she the little girl or is this just like a random connection? I mean, I'm sure this is on purpose, right? Like this, this is the level of stuff. There's Thumper, the stripper that we learned about from earlier. Can't write the word. We have this a couple times. What's the word? I don't know. So this is another thing I noticed that I thought was interesting. And I don't know if it means anything, but we have a mention of um, Oliver North being in the news. And this is the second time I noticed a reference to the Iran-Contra scandal. Excuse my handwriting, I know it's terrible. But um, if you're not familiar with the Iran-Contra scandal, this was when the US got caught illegally selling weapons to Iran when they weren't supposed to be, and then also using funds from that to support the Contra rebel group that they also weren't supposed to be doing. I don't know what this is intended to mean in the context of the book, but I'm noting it here because this is the second time that it's mentioned something related to the Iran Contra scandal. Therefore, I feel like there's probably some kind of meaning in it because that's what this book is about. Um, we have Karen, who is the mom in the house, doing some stuff with the occult, and we have creepy stuff happening in the house. And this is interesting. I don't know if this is on purpose, but we have this passage about the history of Karen. And a couple of things are worth noting here. When she was 15, she suddenly developed phobias and maybe had some kind of trauma responses to things. It mentions her having near aphonia, which means loss of ability to speak, which is odd because like, we don't see her unable to speak. She just like smiles through stuff. But where is it down here? Um, there's there's this whole thing about how at one point before they moved into the house, she was part of a study to treat her severe panic attacks when confronting dark enclosed spaces, particularly in an unfamiliar 
um, buildings. And we have like this list of things that she experiences, some of which are typical for panic attacks, but also derealization, feelings of unreality and eventual depersonalization being detached from oneself, which is pretty intense. What's interesting about it is that she eventually found some relief on Prozac, but she went off of it because of moderate weight gain and orgasmic dysfunction. Um, but then it goes on to say she will occasionally, when the attacks become more frequent, return to taking Prozac. So this, I think, is important because we find out that when some of these bad things start happening in the house, she's getting these panic attacks. And then we know from the videos that both her and her husband complain about how when they first moved into the house, they would have sex a lot. And now she's just not interested, which makes me wonder, is it because she's going on Prozac? Is it because it caused her orgasmic dysfunction and now she's not interested in sex? Um, that that seems to probably be what's what's happening here. This is another weird thing that it notes is that um, because we have two different versions of the five and a half minute hallway, which is like video footage of this hallway that suddenly appeared that shouldn't be able to exist. So what's interesting about it is that um, in the original footage, the hallway is said to be, I think, in the west side of the living room or the west wall or something. And then in the longer video, it's in the north wall. So are they just different hallways? Are these two different videos? Like lots of questions that I, I, who knows? This is another thing where I'm like, is this a misspelling or is it on purpose? It's supposed to say key, but it says kai, which is an archaic Scottish word meaning cows or cattle. So I don't know if it's on purpose. And if it is, I don't know what it means, but I looked it up. <laughs> like this book this book is a trip guys um oh and this is where i would like theorizing about the um her being her being back on prozac with the sex stuff uh and then this is interesting there's this whole section where apparently a couple of celebrities must have come to visit but it, they leave the names blank who are they i don't know Whew. okay so yeah i think that's pretty much pretty much it. This is going to be such a long video and I don't know how interesting this is for everybody, um, but I'm having fun with it. It's interesting. I'm going to try to get through the next bit a little bit faster because it took me like a long time to do, to do all of this, which shouldn't be shocking, but I'm having a good time with it. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what it all means, but I am the kind of reader that gets a kick out of trying to piece things together. Um, plus, there's just like creepy stuff happening, which is interesting. I will check back in once I've made some more progress. Good morning. I'm here for an update on House of Leaves. I spent a lot of yesterday and last night reading and got to a point where I was just like, okay, my brain needs a break. I like as much as I enjoy it, it's a kind of exhausting, at least the way I'm doing it, because it requires you to pay such close attention. It's not like an easy slip into it reading experience. It's like a very active reading experience, which isn't a bad thing. It's just I'm realizing if I didn't need to finish it this weekend so I can record a podcast episode about it, I would probably take a lot longer getting through it, which is probably what most people do. And to be honest, I'm also probably spending a lot more time on my reading and annotating than a lot of people do their first time reading this book. So I'm enjoying the experience, but it's a little exhausting. And I guess one question people might have is, is it scary? And, uh... I don't know, like it has its moments that are definitely creepy. I think for me, I'm spending so much time trying to tease out clues and like deconstruct things and figure things out that I'm not spending a lot of time actually being scared by anything. And, but I also think part of this is going to depend on what scares you because the main thing with the house right is the fact that it's the the spatial awareness thing it's that spaces get larger than they should be or new spaces appear inside a place where they shouldn't exist and i mean like if you were living i guess if you were living in a house where that was happening it could be creepy but i also read so much portal fantasy that it's not like that crazy for me like i'm like yeah 
this is like a horror version of of uh, <laughs> like the Wayward Children series by Shonda McGuire, but creepy, you know. Um, so I don't know. Like I guess like that concept doesn't freak me out in the way that maybe it does some people. And the other part of it is that clearly it's a metaphor because it shifts and changes with their relationship with each other and their family dynamics. So like it's not a static place. It's an echo or a reflection of the distance between them and of issues in their family. So like it's 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 a metaphorical space that does have monsters in it, just like we have monsters in our I don't know, like it's a lot of metaphor, which I find interesting and I enjoy reading. I just don't find it scary. You know what I mean? Like there are moments in the book, there have like been a few moments where I'm like, ooh, okay, like I'm getting kind of creeped out, especially early on. But the more I dig into it, the less I'm like, scared and the more I'm just like intrigued because there are so many layers to what he's doing with this book. It's pretty wild. Okay, so guys, last night, yesterday and last night, there was a lot of skipping around more than there had been before. So I read a lot of the book, but not all linearly. So let's talk about some of it. All right, here we go. Okay, so in terms of the linear story, I read like another 40 pages maybe, which doesn't sound like a lot, but like this, this puppy is dense. But then I read at the end, oh yeah, this is, there was a lot. Um, so I read a lot of the appendices and a big part of this is telling you more about the backstory of Johnny and how he is maybe connected with the main story. Um, if you recall, he's the one in the footnotes. These are letters from his mother, who was in a institution for mental health issues. And um, there's, I mean, like, this is all of her letters. So I read all of that. And then I also was told to skip ahead to certain chapters. So I read parts of a couple of other chapters. So like, <laughs> I am hoping that, um, like, I've read more than it looks like, I guess is basically is basically what it is. This book is just like a, a giant freaking puzzle box, though. There's so many, so many details. Oh boy, where do we start? Okay, I don't think I talked about this here. Um, there's a lot of stuff with ink. Obviously, there's ink in the books. There was ink from the newspaper clipping of Johnny's dad's death. He becomes a tattoo artist. He falls and gets ink all over the place, like black ink that's black, like the hallways in the haunted house of the manuscript he's writing. Like, I mean, there's just like layers upon layers to this, right? Meanwhile, he fell down the steps, which is paralleling what we'll, what we see later when Tom falls off the wagon of sobriety. So there's a lot of a lot of parallels, a lot of echoes, um, which is like a whole thing in the book with the creepy house, but also between characters in different parts of the story where you'll see them kind of parallel each other in interesting ways. And, you know, another piece of this is there's also ink in the letters from his mom, which becomes she ends up becoming a, like pretty important, I would say. I am curious, like, is Thumper Daisy or an echo of Daisy? This is like an ongoing question that I have. So I'm going to go to the letters because this is the point at which I read the letters from his mom and they are a trip, man. The other thing that I have learned through Googling stuff is apparently this author is also a fan of anagrams. And so this has added a whole new layer to like me trying to see if I can figure out the anagrams. So like his mom is in the Three Attic Whales Toe Institute and Apparently, Whale's Toe is an anagram for whose story, asking the question of whose story is this that we're telling. There's a lot of like little stuff, like how much does it add to the plot? I don't know, but like it's, it's, it's interesting. And in his very first letter, his mom says, love inhabits more than just the heart and the mind. If need be, it can take shelter in a big toe. And she is at the Whale's Toe Institute. So, you know, I mean, silly, but. So these letters to him begin when he's like 11 years old and she was taken away from him. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but we eventually learn that his mom was abusive. She had mental health issues. When he was four years old, she burned him when she was cooking. She says she didn't intend to, but we know that that happened. And then I think when he was like eight, she tried to kill him through asphyxiation and his dad uh, stepped in, came home and saved him. And then she went to this institution at that point and she thought she was doing something positive. But so, so she's, you know, mommy's got some, 
some, some issues she's dealing with. One thing that's interesting is she says happy birthday to him June 21st. His birthday is in June, and in the other narrative, creepy stuff starts happening in June. So that seems to be an important type of year. She also references Mead Hall from Beowulf, which we'd seen referenced previously. So it's interesting. There's a lot of parallels between her and Zampano um, in like things that she says. This I thought was interesting. She mentions that he learned the word changeling. So does Johnny feel like a changeling? What does that mean? I don't know. Here's another connection to Mead Hall. We, we have um, these references popping up periodically. There's a lot of literary and historical references in here. So I looked these up. She's, she's talking about how she's found out that his foster dad is abusing him as well. And then later on, I read Johnny's perspective where he talks about Raymond the Marine who is this, the, the foster dad he has. I do have a question because Raymond is begins with an R and Zampano had a gun with initials R something something. And so like was Zampano Raymond the Marine? Like, is that a connection? That would be interesting. I don't know if that's something people have thought of before, but possibly. They never actually met. He never met Zampano. He just got his stuff after he was dead. So Maybe. Who knows? She mentions, like, doesn't he know the fate of Claudius or Ugolino? And I was like, okay, who are these people? Claudius was a Roman emperor who was poisoned by his wife, the mother of Nero, to kind of make way for his power and um, her son taking power. And Ugolino is a character, he was a real life historical figure, but he shows up in Dante's Inferno, where he is punished for betraying his people with eating his sons, which is uh, quite disturbing. So... A lot of, lot of random references there. Like, the things I have learned reading this book and Googling stuff. This was another thing that I looked up. She says, uh, you, your letters have turned your mother into a silly schoolgirl, which is kind of weird. Like, Hawthorne's Faith, I put pink ribbons in my hair. And so I was like, who is Hawthorne's Faith? So I looked it up, and apparently this is referring to a story by Nathaniel Hawthorne called Goodman Brown, where Faith is the main character's wife. So that's kind of creepy. She's writing to her son. And uh, the pink ribbons supposedly represent faith and purity, but end up being surface level because faith ends up joining the witches. So like, I don't know what that all means, but that's the reference here, in case you were wondering. This, I was like, who's Donnie? Oh yeah, Donnie is the name of his dad. Like Donnie, you two were born with the wind under your wings. His dad was a pilot is something that we've learned through this. Thing I noticed this is the second time that I saw um, Zampano says this in his manuscript where he s uses the phrase tore me to Pisces instead of tore me to pieces. And then in the mother's letters, this happens again. So I did a little research because I was like curious, like, what's the deal with Pisces? Two things. They are emotionally sensitive and sympathetic. They're a water sign. But also, I know my terrible drawing, but, but this is like supposed to be two fishes swimming. This is the sign for Pisces. It's mirrors or echoes of each other. So that's interesting. Again, we're like with this trope and theme of mirroring and echoing, like it's showing up everywhere. Okay, so this this again is interesting. She says that nitwit Raymond, who insists on calling you beast, let his blindness protect you. Raymond, again, is the abusive foster dad. And I'm like, blindness, is this Zampano? Um, you know, like, could Raymond be Zampano? That would be such an interesting connection. That seems possible. And we learn some things about his mother's condition. She has a hallucinatory condition. She hears things. And we have to wonder in the rest of the text, is it genetic? Did Johnny inherit the same condition as his mom? He's like seeing and hearing weird things. Is it real or is it um, like a mental health thing? And then his mom basically starts to like lose it and become increasingly paranoid. And then at some point she tells him she's going to start hiding messages in her letters where like, the first letter of each word will be like turn into a key. So did I spend a whole bunch of time figuring out um, the message in these three pages of text? Yes, yes, I did. We can sum it up by saying that basically it's her talking about having been sexually assaulted. And she mentions the stranger, which is interesting because the stranger shows up in the main narrative as well. So like, again, is there a connection? Is the stranger the person who came in and sexually assaulted her at night? It's like super creepy. And at the point that he's receiving this letter, Johnny would have been like 16. The other thing that's interesting, and, and we'll, I'll get back to this later, is that she talks in her letters about being a Spanish doll. I think his mom is Spanish. She uses Spanish words throughout it. So like, 
this I kind of looked up search for me look after me remember me she uses Spanish throughout her letters and refers to herself as a Spanish doll and then that is mirrored in the Zampano transcript where we hear about Daisy playing with her Spanish doll it's interesting his mother really does show up throughout the text in these interesting ways. I will say this is a little bit of a cheat that I even know this is a thing, but I happened to see it on a message board and wanted to go find it. She hid a message in here that says, Zampano, who did you lose? So again, like this suggests that there's some kind of a connection between Zampano and Johnny's mom. And then we have this, where she talks about practicing her smile in a mirror the way she did when she was a child. This is something that we know Karen did. Karen is the mom living in the house, and she also practiced her smile in a mirror, and that mirror shows up when she kind of cleans house later on, which is interesting. She starts losing it. She thinks there's like this creepy new director, and so I have questions about this. And I was like looking, because they do all these things with the way that new director is formatted, and you know, again, there's a lot of talk about echoes and anagrams and parts of words and rearranging words. And so I was like, okay, like, what are some of the words that you can find in the phrase new director? Ned, ecto, dire, tor, then nude, which is interesting because like the, you know, we have like the, the thing about sexual assault from earlier, ire, you. So I don't know how much of that is important, but like, it's interesting. It purposefully kind of plays around with that in these letters when his mom is kind of losing it a little bit. The other thing about it is that um, when she is sane, she will sign her letters mom or mommy, but when she's not, she signs them P. And so who is P? Here this is, tossed like a doll, Spanish. She's the Spanish doll. Um, I mean, this this is this is what this ends up looking like. But then she kind of like gets it back together and we get more normal letters from her again. Her very last letter, instead of saying, Dear Johnny, she says, Dear John, which is a bit of a change. And she references herself as Sybil of Cume. So the Sybil of Cume was a priestess or prophetess at the Apollonian Oracle in um, like Greek history. And she's a prophetess that was painted on the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo. So that's kind of interesting that she's styling herself as a prophetess or an oracle, and I think that is probably important. And then lastly, we get a, a letter from the director of the institution telling us that she has committed suicide. And this is also the first time we see her name, although we do know from the editor's note at the beginning of the letters that some names were changed, so this may or may not be her actual name, but she is called Pelafina Heather Livre, um, so P for Pelafina. One thing that is interesting about this is that I, again, saw this on a message board. I, I saw a couple of little things like this, but uh, Livre is misspelled down here, and here the spelling means book, so that's kind of interesting. And then one other thing I noticed somebody talking about was the importance of the fonts that are being used for people, the, the titles of the fonts, and so I thought this was interesting. The font that Johnny is using is called Courier, and in some ways he is a courier, right, of this text. Zampano's is in Times, the editors are in Bookman, which is funny, and then Pelafina's letters are in Dante, which is, I'm guessing, probably a reference to Dante's Inferno, so I thought that was, that was pretty interesting. Oh my god, this is gonna be like the longest video. So moving back to earlier chapters, we're at chapter seven. This I thought was interesting. We have a new character being introduced, Holloway Roberts, and it says he was born in Menomone, Wisconsin, and this kind of jogged my memory because I went through and underlined on this page some random things. So if we go to page 65, we have this list of people um, involved in a photography thing, and because I thought maybe it would matter, I went through and like underlined stuff that seemed interesting that wasn't just names, and one of the things that we have here is the Wisconsin Death Trip, which I think is the name of a photo photograph in this book. But based on things that we learn later about Holloway dying, I'm pretty sure that is connected here with Holloway Roberts, born in Wisconsin. Um, he is the Wisconsin Death Trip. He, he's a professional hunter. He comes to explore the house. And um, I know because of the way I'm reading the book that he ends up dying, even though I haven't actually seen him die on page yet, I've seen the aftermath of it. So that's kind of like an interesting 
an interesting thing. So, um, so in this narrative, we have these new people coming to, to showing up to do these explorations on video of the the hallways that keep getting bigger and deeper and uh, there's growls so like they're wondering what's what's going on. This is something that I find interesting too is that in a certain book Holloway is always referred to as the stranger and you know the the person who assaulted P um, well, we'll go by P because I it's a long name, but P refers to one of the people who assaulted her as the stranger. So is it the same person? Is so then we have another footnote from Johnny. And this I thought was interesting again. And I noticed this because I had already read his mom's letters. But he says, what I imagine now must have been the very Aegeus of Mars. Um, this is a call to arms, though all of it still held back by what words, I guess, or rather a voice, though whose I have still have no clue. And um, clearly this is his mother's. Um, this is stuff that gets mentioned in his mom's letters. So it's interesting that he's like, I don't know. I don't know whose the voice is or who's telling me these things. But like, these are things his mom told him um, when he was like getting into a lot of fights as a kid in her letters to him, which makes me like wonder a little bit about his memory and like what he actually recalls of the letters. I've, there have been three different mentions of the which wall of the house, like north, south, or west, like the, the hallway, the, the weird hallway that keeps appearing is on. And this discussion of how a compass is useless and doesn't work might explain the inconsistencies in the directional wall that contains the hallway. Maybe like that could be part of it. Sequentially, that's where I've stopped. But there are a couple of other chapters that I've made notes in as well that I've gotten to. And one thing I noticed is on this page, page 97, there's a little check mark in the bottom. And in one of P's letters to her son, when she's getting paranoid about people reading her mail, she says, leave a small check mark on the page where no one will notice it. So I know that like you got this. And so it's interesting that again, she, she's <laughs> like, like there, there's a things about that are showing up throughout the book. So weird things about the way this book is, is that house is always in blue and the word Minotaur or anything about the Minotaur is always in red. And this is where we start getting some information about the Minotaur. There's like a whole footnote talking about it. So if you guys don't know the story of the Minotaur, it's in Greek mythology, I'm not going to hash it out here. But here is something interesting. The mother of the Minotaur is Pasiphae. And so this makes me wonder because Pasiphae is not that big of a jump from Pelophena, especially since we know that the names were somewhat changed. And this is a theory that the Minotaur didn't actually have the head of a bull, was in, but was instead a person born disfigured with a disfigured face. So we know that Johnny was probably disfigured from the burns. He was called Beast by Raymond. Is Johnny the Minotaur or the Minotaur? Um, that That is a question that I have. Is Pelophena supposed to be like Pasiphae? Is Johnny this, this Minotaur or whatever? Because there's the discussion of how Minos, because he was ashamed of his son, built this maze to keep his son in. So are the hallways in the house supposed to be akin to this maze? Like, is that what's going on here? That's that that I find interesting. And then we have this chapter about the Minotaur, which I read part of, which was definitely interesting. And it starts with this pretty creepy story about how the children made these disturbing paintings or drawings at school, which made their teacher want to investigate. And when she showed up, she found them with freaking out grown ups and dead bodies and blood and stuff is basically what ends up happening. But this is interesting, right? Because again, we've got co different colors that have been mentioned other places for writing, drawing these monsters and these like creepy black squares on there. It, they're, they're, they're super creepy, like the children's drawings are creepy. But again, um, throughout the book, we have references to all of these vibrant colors, references to ink. And again, we've got that in the children's drawings. Daisy as a trauma response is quietly singing words no one else could understand. Ba, da, ba, ba. Which we've gotten things early in the book about how echoes can shorten words. So I'm wondering, could this be like the ball, door, and papa? I don't know. Or maybe maybe something else. But I feel like this is probably important. Da, I'm guessing, is door. Like, that's probably probably what's going on here. Um, again, she's playing here. She is playing with her Spanish doll, which we know is a parallel to P. And again, this is interesting that Karen, like one of the things she throws out is a small hand mirror 
P practiced her smile in a hand mirror. Um, Karen did as well. So yeah, this is interesting because this is what's happening when Karen is finally getting ready to leave her husband with her children after he's made some foolish and dangerous choices for their family. She's throwing out her Bible and tarot cards and New Age manuals and books and a small hand mirror, um, which is how she practices her smile. So she's deconstructing her walls and her coping mechanisms. Yeah, that is, uh, that is where I'm at. I'm going to keep reading and I will check back in again once I've made some more progress. But uh, this this has been a ride, guys. A freaking ride. Oh my god, you guys. I feel like I'm losing my mind reading this book. <laughs> not really, not really. But like, my brain hurts. It feels like I'm back in grad school. I will come back later with like a more full overview of like stuff I've been reading. But I just discovered something and... I need to put it on this video because my mind is kind of blown right now. I've been reading this book all day. My brain is hurting. I feel like I'm back in grad school. It's interesting, but like, God, it's a lot of work. Um, so I was like, you know, I'm just going to take a break for a minute. And I'm kind of curious about the author. Like, let me Google Mark Danielewski. Who is he? There's a lot of interesting stuff. I'd recommend looking up his Wikipedia page if you get a chance because like it explains a lot about all the things that are in this book. Like he he was born in New York to a guy who was an avant-garde filmmaker. He traveled a lot growing up. He learned different languages. He went to Yale for like English literature and then he studied Latin. So like all of this clearly has like played a role in, in why the book is what it is. But that is not what blew my mind. <laughs> Okay, so Mark Danielewski has a younger sister um, and she has like her birth name, but she is commonly known as Poe, this singer songwriter. Okay, so what's interesting is, and this just throws a whole other like meta level to House of Leaves. In 1995, she put out her debut album and on that album, there was a song called Angry Johnny. And it, it appears to be a song about this guy who sexually assaulted her about, about S.A. Johnny Truant is this character in this book. So quick update, I tracked down the music video for the original song, Angry Johnny, and I will say, like, I think hearing the way she sings, it complicates what I think it means. Um, I think reading, just reading the lyrics straight up on paper, I was like, okay, this sounds like a, it's about somebody who sexually assaulted you. And maybe there's still some element of that, but I think with like hearing the way she actually sings it, I think it's probably more about a toxic relationship. Um, and maybe there were some consent issues in there, but like, it's a little more complicated than that. So I don't want to like say that's what it was. This book is 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 something else and the way that they're like drawing on each other's work <laughs> like, it is interesting though she made this original song angry johnny before he ever wrote the book like five years before the book um although it's possible he already had the idea of it or was working on it but then in 2000 she put out another album and keep in mind house of leaves was also published in the year 2000 so i have to imagine this was some kind of an intentional collaboration between the brother and sister. Um, but she put out this album with a song titled Dear Johnny. And in that song, the lyrics say, I will keep your secret safe. Bring me to the blind man who lost you in his house of blue. Holy shit. <laughs> The blind man, obviously we're talking about Zampano, his house of blue, house is always written in blue and house of leaves, like the meta-ness of this book, you guys, are just like, what the hell? Tell me if you knew this because my mind is blown. Anyway, um, I will link the songs below if you want to check them out, but th th this book is a trip. The book is The Labyrinth. Seriously, though, like, it does kind of get in your head. It, like, it, the, I feel like if you read it the way I'm reading it, it feels like the experience of being lost in a labyrinth and you feel like you're never going to get out. You're never going to get to the end. And that's kind of how I feel about reading the book. It's like, because 
like you return over things you've already read and it brings new meaning and you feel like you're not progressing but you sort of are but you're not and it's like it's weird um anyway I have spent pretty much my whole day reading this book until I finally started developing a headache so I like took some ibuprofen and took a nap and I think I dreamed about the book <laughs> Part of it, I think, is, like, my brain is just not used to focusing this intensely on something in this way anymore. I haven't been in grad school in years, and, like, that's what this feels like. Um, it takes so much work, man. I want to be done. Like, can I just have a nice romance that's, like, easy to read? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, it is daunting. It is, it's, this thing is, it's a lot. It's interesting, but part of me is starting to wonder, right? Because it's like the book itself talks about these rooms that have no real meaning. They just lead from one room into the next and never really get anywhere. And I'm starting to have this like creeping dread that that's exactly what the book is going to be like. Which, if that's how I'm feeling, means that the book is probably accomplishing its goal. <laughs> oh my god. Anyway, I'm, I'm like, caught because, like, I have a live stream tonight. I need to put on some makeup and eat and I kind of want to do something else. But then part of me wants to just, like, keep reading and see if I can make some progress. But then I feel like it's never going to end. <sighs> Hello. It is the next day in the afternoon. I took a break last night for the Two Towers live stream. Talked to some friends. I showered today. Like, I'm, I'm feeling... I'm feeling good and uh, just got done filming some videos. I have made a lot of progress on this. So I probably have a lot of ground to cover. Um, I, I maybe should have done another update yesterday, but I was just tired, number one, and also feel, you know, I have some video updates, but like honestly feeling lost in the labyrinth of this book. And I do think it's interesting. One thing that I think that this book is very successful in doing is writing it in a way where it's got these meta elements that match the psychological state of the reader. Maybe not for every reader, but certainly for me, this is how I felt reading it. So at the point in the book in which it's going into all this stuff about labyrinths and retreading the ground you walk and like how you get out or get lost in the labyrinth, I was feeling like, oh my god, this book is a labyrinth and I'm caught in it and it's never going to end and I'm never going to get out. Like what what the hell? And then today, I was reading this part on, on page 167 that's like kind of later in the book. I know that doesn't sound super late, but if you're following all of the threads like I have been, it is actually pretty late in your reading experience. And um, what's funny is it talks about boredom and that boredom could be because of repetition or it could be because you're repressing something like horror. And I'm like, oh my god, are we talking about the reader? Because Am I bored at the moment that I'm reading this? Yes, I kind of am because I feel like this is like never going to end and where is it going? And I just think it's funny that psychologically it's doing a good job of like intentionally making it feel labyrinthine and feel repetitive and then commenting on it as a way of trying to like creep you out as a reader. I think it's so kind of clever. Um, I still think this book is hella pretentious so pretentious and requires a lot of the reader but I think if you're up for it it's an interesting project and overall I, I've been having a pretty good time with it I've had moments where I'm like I have like okay like yesterday I read for so long that like I got a twitch in my eye and I had a headache and I had to lay down and take a nap <laughs> Like, I have not put this amount of work into reading something since I was in grad school. It, th th this is probably going to feel like my biggest accomplishment for 2021 is getting through House of Leaves. I, I like added up the sections I haven't read yet and I have about 200 pages left to go in the book, which is pretty good because it's 700 pages long. Um, I don't know that I'm going to take you through all of my notes on everything but I will pull you through some of it. I, I, you know, it's, it's creative. And one thing that I think is interesting too is there are chapters that take place while they're inside the labyrinth and the structure of the words on the page, the structure of the footnotes 
is mirroring that experience of being inside a labyrinth, which is which is interesting. It's one of those things that you could hate and find really irritating as a reading experience, or you could say, well, this is this is clever and you know effectively giving you the vibe of what it's like to be there. I just there, there's a lot there's a lot in here, and you know, and then there's like little there's stuff like okay, hold on, like like this. This is a section on the Minotaur that I talked about earlier and that I saw someone mention that it is shaped like a key. So I, I, I traced it. It's because I guess the Minotaur is a key. I will tell you in terms of what I'm thinking and I there are several things that have happened in the book that give me evidence that make me think I'm right. I think that the Minotaur is definitely supposed to be Johnny. I think there's a lot of evidence for that. We learn more about some of the disfigurement that he has on his arms because of his mother burning him when he was a child. We learn more about like other scarring that he has and there, there's some other stuff as well but like I'm basically convinced that Johnny is like the Minotaur or whatever. What, what that means? I don't know. <laughs> Does it mean anything? Does anything in this book mean anything? I don't know. Is it just a puzzle box? Maybe, maybe. This is so not gonna be everybody's cup of tea, but it's it's very interesting. There are just so many little like connections and puzzles and you can do such a deep dive. It is a trip. Okay, um, let's do a little bit of a flip through and then I'm gonna say probably I will come back for a final update once I have finished the book. Okay, so I'm not sure exactly where to start with this because I jumped around so much, but this is one of the chapters that is what I'm talking about is there's like upside down text and text that goes across things and like mirrored text on pages. That's interesting. One thing I want to point out that is um, interesting here in they say this in a couple of places, but this is kind of a creepy take on the Bible verse where Jesus says in my father's house are many rooms this idea that the house is God or divine in some way and that like these endless rooms or this labyrinth is like what a God or a God's house is like, which is kind of interesting. We get some information here about his memory of how he got these scars and we learn more about it from corn oil. He thinks that it was his fault, not his mother's fault, but we know from the letters that is probably not the case. These expeditions into the house and into like these labyrinthine areas is compared to explorers, which is interesting, like Magellan and whatever, which, but it's like foolish. And I guess the question I'm left with is, are we asking what is there left to explore in the world but echoes of our own darkness? It keeps em emphasizing the labyrinth. Here's another place where I'm thinking, is this evidence that Johnny is the Minotaur? It talks about um, the bald gnome error who comes from his cave with featherless ankles to feast on the mighty dead. And then Johnny has a thing saying, you got me. And he does this on another page as well. So like, is he the one coming from his cave? Is he the beast? Um, or is the beast coming from the mind of Holloway, who is like this kind of creepy guy or whatever. I don't, I don't know how to, how much to get into this. It's so complicated. This, I don't know what this means, but this is interesting. In here, there's a mention of TNT and Ashley, who is a girl that Johnny sleeps with, turns out her fiance, who she's going to marry, sells TNT. But this says TNT also can stand for truth and truth or technological neural transmitters. Is this what the fiance sells? What does that mean? Um, and then down here, we've got this reference to the film Eraser, which has an arms corporation selling to terrorists, which is mirroring the references to the Iran Contra scandal throughout the book. So like, what does it mean? I don't know. This is supposedly a typo, but I don't know that it really is one where it says the monster or whatever, whatever comes for those who are never seen again has come from him. And in the footnotes, it says this is a typo is it should is it should says has come for him 
But is it a typo? Who does it come from? Is it Johnny? There's evidence it could be him. There's evidence it could be uh, Holloway, who from his dark mind and some of his past trauma is creating this monster. Um, so a lot of it is like very psychological. It's really interesting. There's also been a couple of mentions earlier of something to do with Noah's Ark. And then this I thought was an interesting description of the Great Hall, which is one of the large areas in the labyrinth, where it says it's like some preternatural hull designed to travel vast seas. So I'm questioning, is this Noah's Ark? Also, we have a character who's down in the labyrinth who gets seasickness. So again, like, is that what we're what we're trying to evoke here? Here, this is saying that maybe Holloway's creature comes from Holloway's mind, not the house. Like this is this is the idea that coming from him would indicate Holloway from his mind might be creating the monster. Then there's this whole chapter and I don't, I'm not quite sure what to think of this honestly, but it's asking questions about whether Tom and Will, who are, Will is Navidson, the guy who created the documentary and Tom is his brother, are they supposed to be like Jacob and Esau or is Holloway the Esau? And like, I don't really know what to do with this. And if they are Jacob and Esau, who's who? What does it all mean? I don't know. Like, this is very meta, and I'm not sure... I, I'm not sure how to interpret all of this or what you're supposed to take away from it, but I, I do think the religious imagery is interesting. We also have this stuff that's Tom's story, and there's something in here that made me wonder if Tom is the framer, um, because he does house construction. I don't know if you remember, but there was a, a thing mentioning the framer, and I had a question, who is the framer? Maybe Tom is the framer. And then he has this whole menagerie of hand shadows that he's casting, similar to the book he's reading for Daisy. From on the flip side of it, we learn, and I don't know if I skipped over this, but we learn that the that Daisy is the little girl, um, but that Chad, her brother, was playing Mist, among other things, which is this game I played when I was a kid. I don't know if like all of you guys know about it, but it was kind of creepy and involved like moving into alternate dimensions that were empty and like trying to solve mysteries and stuff and mist is mentioned in a couple of different places which which is pretty fascinating i do have a theory because there's these uh feng shui objects that are creatures and stuff that keep disappearing like a dragon and a leopard and whatever and the kids have these creepy pictures involving them and meanwhile tom is sort of creating these shadows um, and then ultimately, I think it's eaten up maybe by a dragon <laughs> or something like I, it's it's kind of weird. I like I know he ends up dying somehow. I'm a little unclear on how all of this happens, but I'm wondering if that is where the items are going is Tom is somehow pulling them in. If that's where the kids pictures are coming from is him doing these like shadow puppet things. Oh, yeah. Down here is a mention of Noah's Ark. So again, I kind of think the labyrinth maybe is intended to be like a Noah's Ark. Okay, so I don't want to show too much of this page because I feel like it's just kind of gross. But um, there's a guy named Lude, L-U-D-E, which I'm realizing uh, after reading this is a sign, kind of like Lude, L-E-W-D, which makes sense because there's a whole list that we get to read here of all the women he slept with for a month and it is uh, pretty gross. So um, yeah, that's kind of icky. I mean, Johnny is also kind of gross, honestly. Yeah, there's a lot of like sexist stuff in this area. So here's another thing with the house of like, in my father's house are many rooms, house contains eternity. Is the house God? Um, there's this dream that Navidson has with this like blue light where the blue light is good. House is written in blue throughout the text. Maybe that's part of why. These dreams he has honestly are pretty creepy. Um, and there's a lot of like parallels, right? He dreams of the snail, which is similar to the spiral staircase that exists in the like, the, the creepy part of the house that they're exploring that just keeps growing. There's more stuff comparing Johnny and this dream that he has to the legend of the Minotaur. Um, so I think Johnny's intended to be the Minotaur. There's more references to Raymond the Marine. He has this dream about a frat boy who I think is supposed to be like Theseus who tries to kill him with an axe, but then he transforms into women he slept with like Thumper and Kyrie and Ashley. I don't know if you ever actually slept with Thumper, but he was into her. Anyway, I think they're intended to maybe be stand-ins for Ariadne in the myth because in some ways Ariadne, who 
maybe the Minotaur was in love with, like one could argue, it is really the one who killed him by helping Theseus. I thought that was interesting. The third dream is missing, but there's evidence that it might have been about Jonah and the whale and was particularly disturbing. There was another place that mentioned Jonah as well. There's references to the labyrinth being like Noah's Ark. There's references to it maybe being like the belly of the whale that Jonah ended up in. Lots of religious references here. And then I'm not sure what to make of these, but they're kind of interesting. In the index, there are these things called the Pelican Poems, and there's some interesting stuff in here. Um, so I looked up the word Pelican in the index because I'm like, who is the Pelican? Pelican Jake apparently wrote all of these poems traveling throughout Europe. And in the index, Pelican shows up as a descriptor of a, a black color. So we have pelican black. And then there's another place where there's the pelican pen. So it's like the pelican represents ink or blackness, I guess. So I don't know exactly what that means, but some of these poems are really interesting. There's a lot of references to Greek mythology. We've got this poem entitled Pelican Jake on the Eurydice school bus. And Eurydice was the wife of Orpheus, who he tried to bring back from death with his music and uh, failed, if you're not familiar with the mythology. There's also this reference to Quisling, who was the former minister of Norway during World War II. There's a few references to World War II throughout the book, which is kind of interesting. But now the word Quisling, not capitalized, is used as a synonym for somebody who collaborates with the enemy force because he worked with the Nazis during World War II. This is interesting too. There's two places where St. John and Pelican are next to each other, and it turns out um, Pelican Rock on St. John is a little known snorkeling destination in the Virgin Islands. I don't know what any of this means, but it feels intentional. It's interesting. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to mention, because this is like the wildness of this, is there is this chapter that is all about more that has Morse code written into it. I kid you not, I spent time looking up the Morse code alphabet so I could try to figure out if this like meant anything. These were the letters that I found and if you take out the D it could mean like so effed, which might make sense with Johnny. Is that intentional? Does it mean anything? I don't know, but I, I spent time doing it. So yeah, I, I did forget this part of it. I will say there are definitely some ableist elements to here. The way that they talk about Rustin, who's in a wheelchair, and I, I didn't love some of that. I have some issues with it. Also, this is interesting. There's um, a reference to the Sumerian dark, and I was like, what does Sumerian mean? So Sumerians were apparently people from Greek mythology that lived in perpetual mist and darkness near the land of the dead, which if you've read this makes a lot of sense because there is perpetual darkness. There's a lot of death that exists in the labyrinth. Um, so there's there's apt descri descriptions there, I guess. More ableist stuff. Oh, here's where we have the mist things um, that Chad played D&D &D and missed, which which is interesting. And Tom was reading to Daisy possibly where the wild things are, which again is interesting given the fact that he does these like hand puppets and stuff. So yeah, that is it for now. I will be back with my final update once I finish the book. I did it! I finished House of Leaves! <laughs> oh man, I, this feels like probably my biggest accomplishment of the year, if I'm being honest. This was a wild ride. It was a lot of work to read, which I know I've said. Oh, boy, there were a lot of revelations in the last 200 pages, but it's the kind of book that doesn't have clear answers. It's going to leave you guessing. And so I feel like the ending, it's sort of like, did any of this actually happen? or did it not? It depends on how you interpret things. Was it real or was it made up from Zambano as a story? There could be evidence for either of those things as well. Like it, it, it basically leaves a lot of different threads and questions open. Are some of these things mental health issues or are there things that actually happened? Like we don't really know and you can have theories and you can make guesses, but I think it intentionally leaves it where there's lots of different sort of conclusions you can draw, threads you can follow. <laughs> um, yeah, this was, this was a really interesting experience. It's also just like so meta <laughs> on so many levels 
there's a scene in the later part of the book in one of the Johnny parts where he goes to a bar and hears a band play a song called The Five and a Half Minute Hallway and then is like, wait a minute, it, do, you, do you know about this movie? Because he'd been working on putting the book together but hadn't actually submitted it for publication. And they're like, oh man, it's from this book we found online. Here it is. And it's this book, including all of his notes. There's like a few things like that where it's all super circular. Like, is any of this real? When did all of it happen? How does the book exist before it's been published? Or is it all just made up? Or is it a dream? Or is it like, what? what is it? Did Zampano make it up? Because there are definitely also things in here Zampano's the like blind dude, right, who wrote the manuscript. There's also things in here that would indicate that he could have gone a different way with the story. And so it was something he just kind of like made up for these purposes, but maybe not. Like, we, we don't know. <laughs> and, you know, this is the sort of book that I feel like for readers who do not like open ended endings, could be super duper frustrating. The other thing that I think complicates the narrative is there's a scene where an unnamed woman has a baby who is born with like holes in his brain and then the baby dies and like there could be an argument made that that baby was actually Johnny and like none of this ever really happened or it's an alternate version of him but we don't really know because it doesn't tell us any of that so <laughs> like, this book is a, a trip and a half you guys um I I'm gonna do a little bit of a flip through for some of my notes for those final couple hundred pages I read and then I'll meet you back here with my final thoughts on the book. All right, let's do this. I don't even know. It's hard because now that I've read so much, it's like, where where did I end? All right, so there's a lot of like weird random stuff that happens in this area. This is talking about Holloway and his background. So there's this whole thing about his like childhood trauma and how when he was 17, he was in love with this woman named Elizabeth. And he described her as beautiful like a doe which is weird, number one. But then he felt like he had to prove himself and he thought he was shooting a buck, but it ended up being a doe that he shot. And I think later on in the book, we also get a mention of a doe or a deer. There's a couple of other mentions, um, including like it's a ways before we get there, but it ends up that Johnny, after his mom had died, got one piece of jewelry that she had owned, which was this deer shaped locket. So I don't really know what this all means, but the deer slash doe thing seems to be a repeated theme. This is interesting. There's parts where like letters are cut out and Holloway has some of the letters cut out of his name. So it looks like holy. I don't know why. I don't know if that's on purpose. It might be. And I don't know. There's all this stuff about like sons and fathers and like the myth is the Minotaur. The Minotaur was a son who was in prison because of his father's shame. And like these are these are just like repeated tropes you see discussed. I don't know like what to take away from that. So this I just thought was interesting. It's kind of shaped maybe like a minotaur. If you look at the shape of it, again, it's more stuff about fathers and sons um, saying Navidson didn't build the labyrinth. So who is Minos? I don't, I don't really know, honestly. This was, is like not directly related, but there's this description of it, like a, a torture device that shows up in library at Mount Char. And I remember reading that book and like being kind of horrified by it. So it's interesting to know that it's actually a part of real Greek history. So I'm like, ah, that's, that's where that came from. <laughs> it's, yeah. Red comes up a lot. Redwood myth is Redwood. There's no wood in the labyrinth. Who is Redwood? I don't know. There's like a page where it says I said Redwood. I saw him once when I was young and ran away. Like, there's, there's no real answers to all of this, just things I noticed. Okay, one plot hole that I have a little bit with this story is when they're in the labyrinth, things keep disappearing. Like they say, if you're not noticing something or thinking about it, eventually it'll disappear. But you know what never disappears? The cameras. Why is that? Why do the cameras never disappear? But it's possible this whole thing is made up. And so the plot hole doesn't matter because 
this was all an invention of Zampano's mind. I don't know. Okay, this is the part where he gets the jewelry, this ornate deer locket that I had mentioned from his mom. Um, also, I mentioned last time who is Pelican Jake. So after reading on in here, I'm pretty sure the poems, the Pelican Jake poems, are by Johnny because Johnny spent time in Europe and he mentions going to all of the locations or the the countries that those were written in and the dates match up as well so i think johnny is pelican jake which is kind of interesting there's a lot more mentions too of like jonah or the whale there's even a thing of like saying stephen king's response to the film says something something look at ahab's whale or Jonah's whale. But it's also interesting that, and I, I hadn't thought about this, that Johnny's mother is in an institution called Whale's Toe, so she's in the belly of the whale as well. This is a repeated theme. This is a place where there's evidence that maybe this whole thing is made up. This footnote from the editors talk about what I mentioned earlier, that this whole thing is clearly based on Kevin Carter's 1994 Pulitzer Prize winning photograph. Remember I talked about the thing with Delille? Come to find out late in the book, this is actually acknowledged on page that it's inspired by a real world thing, which would be one thing to suggest that the Navidson record is fake. It's just a made up thing that uh, Zimpano came up with. So that's interesting. This is another place that Daisy shows up, the Deutsch Electron Synchrotron, pronounced Daisy in Hamburg, is part of, I think, where they did dating of these samples. They took like wall samples in different parts of the labyrinth and come to find out they are in order from like several thousand years old to like predating the earth and having like alien materials. Again, who knows if this is real or not, but like it's pretty wild if that's the case. Yeah, here that is. Sample A is pretty young, a few thousand years old. K is a few hundred thousand. O over here is in the millions, and the is referring to MMMM through XXXX, well, in the billions. Those last bits there are clearly meteoric. This I just think is kind of funny. There's this note from Johnny where he says, something tells me I've been here a long time, endlessly descending into dead ends, turning around to find other ways in which the end lead only to still more ends. And I think this is in a dream he has, but this is very much what the experience of reading this book is like, which is just is funny. Then there's like references to this story about the Jamestown colony where there, there were these strange stairs suggesting that maybe the house existed near there long ago. If it is real, I, I don't know. Here, the book basically moves words on the page to mimic like what's actually happening in the text which is kind of trippy can you tell i started running out of uh the sticky tabs i was using so i started tearing them in half and then i eventually like found another uh another sheet of them so like in terms of the story right we have this whole thing of davidson goes back to the house and then karen decides that she really wants him and so she goes back to try to find him and they leave and maybe the house disappeared or maybe it didn't. I don't know. There's like a weird piece with Johnny um, where it sounds like maybe he opened the store to free Navidson. Then there's also the possibility that Karen did. And some people think that the light that he sees before he finally exits the maze is Karen's flashlight. Oh, yeah. Okay, this was a whole thing about when he got burned from his mom. It was a pan of sizzling maizola. Maizola oil. Corn oil. And another word for corn is maize. And the whole book is about a maze or labyrinth. Like, there's a lot of wordplay happening. This is a weird passage because he talks about going to have dinner with Thumper, finally learning her real name but they don't tell us what her real name is. So like, I suspect it might be Daisy, but I don't actually know that. And then this is also weird. He says, I waved and with that bid adieu to the happiest place on earth, which is what we call Disneyland. And he calls her Thumper, which is from the movie Bambi, which is a Disney film. <laughs> so kind of random. Okay, so this is super duper weird. There's a whole thing where Navidson is at the end of the maze and all he has left is matches to use to read a book that he has with him. And the book is House of Leaves. 
And then here's what I was talking about earlier, where he meets the band and then he sees the title page that says House of Leaves by Zampano with introduction and notes by Johnny Truant um, by Circles Around a Stone publication, which like there's like a circularity, I guess, to the publication of this, I suppose. But I will say there's a place later on that suggests they didn't actually know which book he had with him and somebody just wrote in House of Leaves to make it creepy. I don't I, I don't know. There's a lot of open ended questions as to like how much of this happened or didn't happen in the world of the book. And then there's a bit where Johnny supposedly suddenly has a memory come back about the day his mom was taken away and is like, she never really did try to kill me. She was wrong or she lied or something. She just tried to wipe tears away from me. So I don't know. Like, did she or didn't she? Who do you believe? Um, is Donnie Minos his dad? Is, is that who Minos is? I don't know. And then it says she was lost, swallowed by the whale. Because, like, where she was. And this is another weird thing. It says he remembers now, suddenly, the details of those five and a half minutes when she was taken away, which is similar to the five and a half minute hallway, which is the first record we have of the weird, like, weird hallways appearing in the Navidson record. This is one line written in purple. I don't know what that means. It's the only thing written in purple, so I don't know. And then this is this whole story about the woman who had a child who died. Um, and at some point she says, Echa puer, but it's actually Latin, Eche puer, which means uh, there is the boy or the child or behold the child, and then the child dies. And like, I think some people theorize that the child is Johnny and he never actually lived. Also, it's interesting Karen kind of overcomes her fear at the end. I, I've, th maybe I'm thinking this because I've been watching for the first time and reading about slasher films, but she feels a bit like she falls into the final girl trope in terms of finally finding her inner strength to defeat the monster, even though the monster is like this labyrinth, I guess. After the last time they got out of the labyrinth, Will Navidson lost one of his eyes, which in kind of in Greek mythology, blindness is related to wisdom or being able to see, see clearly. So now that he's fully been through the labyrinth or been to the end of it, he can maybe see more or something. But there's a, there's a major cost. And then there's like exhibits at the end of the book that have stuff. I don't know how interesting all of this is or how much it really matters to the story. How much does any of it? But I like tried to figure out what all of them were saying. Collages, which are really interesting and mean a lot more, I think, once you've read the book. I also noticed they have stamps of Edgar Allan Poe, and remember his sister is also named Poe, so that's interesting. And also stamps of Jack London, who wrote Call of the Wild, and like that feels very on brand for what this is doing. This is from Pelican Pens. Maybe I remember I talked about the black Pelican Pens. There's just a lot of like items that relate. These are like random quotes. There's one place that talks about Leith, the river of oblivion, having a watery labyrinth. It's the river of death from Paradise Lost. There's this other quote that talks about the personality of the mistress that the home expresses. Karen is the, the mistress of the house which is interesting. So how much does that mean about what happened there? And then the very last page, there's this, which if you put it together, it says Yggdrasil, which in Norse cosmology is an immense sacred tree with branches that are kind of like the rooms in the house and a spiral staircase is kind of like the trunk of this. And then it ends with, what miracle is this? This giant tree, it stands 10,000 feet high, but doesn't reach the ground. Still it stands, its roots must hold the sky. Did we learn anything? Do we know what it all means? No, but it's been a journey. And now I can go see other people's theories, I guess. <laughs> okay, so here are some questions some of you might be wondering. It was this scary? Did I like it? What do I think about it? <laughs> I feel like these are very complicated questions. What would I rate this? Okay. Okay. So first, was it scary? 
Honestly, I don't think it's that scary, but it really just depends on what scares you. If the creepy meta-ness of the story scares you, if the concept of like endless hallways appearing inside this house scares you, if, you know, like feeling like you're having this experience of being lost in the text and lost in the labyrinth of the book and not knowing what the truth is, like if that bothers you or if that's something you find scary or disturbing, then yeah, this book could be scary. Did I find it particularly scary? Not really. It definitely had its moments and it does get under your skin. It does mess with your head a little bit at times, especially when you're reading it so intensively, like I've been for the last few days. It does kind of like get under your skin and leave you with a lot of questions. So in that way, it's like creepy, but I wouldn't call it scary necessarily in the way that I think a lot of people mean. So that, that would, I guess, would be my response to that. Did I like it? Jeez. Ah, uh, I don't know. Yes and no. Some of it. I think it's an accomplishment. I think it's super pretentious, but I think it's an accomplishment to have written this and put this together and created something with so much lasting cachet and power. So I certainly don't think it's a bad book. If I keep putting it on my shoulder, it's because this book is really heavy to hold. <laughs> It's like a really heavy book. <laughs> like, and I've got all my tabs in here. Less, I don't usually I don't usually tab or annotate books when I'm reading, but this one I needed to. Um, I feel like this book is definitely an accomplishment. I think it's an interesting piece of literature. It's an interesting piece of horror. And I do think it's worth reading, especially if you are a horror reader. Like it is a part of the genre that I think is very interesting. And you know, there are parts of it that I did really like. I enjoy a lot of the puzzle box aspect. It was just so long, like there's so much of it. And it's also possible that if I hadn't been trying to read this in a condensed period of time, I would have enjoyed myself more with it. But I mean, you saw on the vlog, there were times that I was like, when is this book ever going to end? But the ending is really satisfying. I feel like the way it wraps it up, okay, satisfying. <laughs> interesting, compelling, satisfying. It doesn't answer all your questions. Um, so I liked it. What would I rate it? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like what, what do you rate this on? Do you rate it on enjoyment? Do you rate it on experience? Do you rate it on like what it is as, as a, as a object in literature? Um, I, I feel like I could see an argument for giving it five stars. My gut is to give it like a four star because I didn't necessarily love everything about it. And I will say, I can see an argument to be made for saying that this is gimmicky. Like I think that's something that people say because like if I were to strip all the labyrinthine pieces out of the plot and just look on the surface at the two primary plots with the Navidson stuff and Johnny's story, how would I feel about those plots? Um, I would think they're reasonably good, but not mind blowing. I think if this was that just kind of bare bones, this would probably end up being like a three to four star read, depending on the writing style, probably like three, three and a half. But the added layers of complexity for me do add something to the experience and make this something a little bit different. So I'm still not sure. I'm waffling a little bit, but, but that's kind of where I land. So. This is a very long video. If you've made it to the end, I am so impressed. I would love to hear from you. Any of your thoughts in the comments below, if you've read this, if you have comments or theories or things that you want to bring up, because like I do think that stuff is super interesting, all the theories and things people have dug into, because I didn't even do everything I could have done. There is more. There is much more <laughs> that one could do. And I did a lot. So um, that I think is, is quite impressive. So if you want to talk about that down below, let me know. If you haven't read this, whether this made you more or less interested in reading it, I, you know, let, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. If you like this video, it helps if you give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you next time.